Hour three of Overdrive on TSN2, TSN 1050, your home speakers, the app, Gord Miller, Frankie Corrado, the captain, Brian Hayes, taking the day off. Hope he's enjoying himself on a beautiful Friday in Toronto. Gorgeous day today. Did he give you the C for the day? Slap it on your not, jersey? No, I, I wear an alternate's A. Yeah. That's a, that's not a, the assistant captain, the alternate captain. That used to be a, So Bob McKenzie used to have the... He was a stickler for certain terminology in hockey. It's a jersey, not a sweater. Now... Or sorry, it's a sweater, it's a not, sweater, a, sweater not a jersey. Sweater, not a jersey. Sorry, no, jerseys become kind of the thing. Yeah. Because they actually are kind of jerseys now. Yeah, it's not a sweater. They, they're, they're, they're a perforated whatever. Um, I would never say that to Bob's face, though, by the way. Dressing room, I would still say sweater. Dressing room, not a locker room. Yeah. That was another one with him. Um, Warm-up, not warm-ups. Yeah. Only one warm-up. Uh, Offside, not offsides. Yeah. Um, morning skate, not skate around. <laughs> Who calls it a skate around? Sometimes south of the border they call it a skate around. Oh, uh, because okay. it's a shoot around. In That's game. right. Okay. And uh, and of course, he was a stickler for it's an alternate captain, not an assistant captain. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. All now, good stuff. But language changes, right? Things yeah. things do change. But yeah, that was uh, that was his thing. So yeah. um, yes, yeah, so I'm wearing the A. Don't say what it stands for. I don't want to hear it. No, I would uh, never. I would never. <laughs> um, Blue Jays in action tonight against the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers, who have won five in a row now, five games back of the last wild card spot in the American League. Jays made a trade today, late this afternoon, sending Jimmy Garcia, the reliever, to Seattle. The the prime player coming back is Jonathan Classe, who is an outfielder. Last year became the first player since stats were kept in the minors to have a 2070 year. 2070. 20 home runs, 70 stolen bases. Speeds his calling card. Some pop in the bat. Steve Phillips likes the deal for the Jays. So this begins the exodus of players who are not under control beyond this year. The 70 stolen bases. And then you kind of read up quickly. And we talked to Steve Phillips and he said speed is going to be a key attribute for this yeah. guy. And listen, we don't need to dive too deep into the the scouting report of this, this kid. Like he's going to have to play in the minors a little bit. He's going to have to work his way up. But do you remember when Charlie Montoyo got fired yeah. and John Schneider was appointed the manager of the team? A lot of the talk was, we are going to be very aggressive. We are going to steal bases. We're going to be a very aggressive offensive team. I don't know how many years later now. Is it three years later? I cannot say that that has been the case for this team. I do not see them as an aggressive offensive team. I see them as a team that very much struggles offensively, and I don't think they push the envelope any more than they did under Charlie Montoyo. They stand around waiting for someone to hit a home run, usually Vladdy. Right. So what happened to that philosophy? I think it's I, I great. Know. I think well, it's they, great they that you go and get a guy that steals bases and is, and is fast. But now, like, let's actually see that implemented well, with part, the players that are there. Part of it would be that, you know, Springer, until lately, had really fallen off. So that, you know, a lot of... And Bo Bichette's had a really off year. He's been injured, but he's had a really off year. So that might be part of it. But yeah, so the... Uh, now, Yusei Kikuchi is, is pitching tonight in what will likely be his last appearance with the Blue Jays for now. Because don't rule out, he lives here year-round. Don't rule out him coming back as a free agent in the offseason. Oh, that happens Like that happens all the time. When I was playing for Toronto, I think Daniel Winnick did like three tours of duty here for the Leafs. <laughs> right? They kept trading him for a pick. Kept moving the deadline. Resign, trade yeah. him for a pick, yeah. go try and win a cup. And Roman Polak did the same thing. So he's 33 years old, um, but he'll pitch tonight against Texas. And, uh, and speaking of that, uh, our FanDuel best bets coming up. I've got my pick. Coming up, it's it's on the Jays game tonight. All right. That's a tease. That's a tease for you. Um, tomorrow, the Olympics get underway in full swing. Uh, it's day zero of the Olympics today. There's been some some activity already. Of course, the soccer tournament's already underway. Uh, rugby started as well. But uh, tomorrow, one of the feature matches is Canada in men's basketball against Greece. And Canada's in the men's tournament for the first time, I believe, since might be the 19, uh, 1990s. Canada in the Olympic basketball tournament. Josh Lewenberg, our... TSN basketball reports with us now. Josh, was it 21 years for Canada since the last Olympic appearance? 24 years. 24 years. Pretty crazy. 2000. The youngest player on this roster, R.J. Barrett, was three months old the last time Canada played an Olympic men's basketball game. And, of course, his father, Rowan, was the yeah. captain of that team. So, so Canada's got the so-called group of death with Greece, Australia, and Spain. Canada plays Greece tomorrow, Australia Tuesday, and then Spain on Friday to wrap up the, the group stage. The top two teams in each group advance to the quarterfinals and the next two teams with the best records. This is a tough group, Josh. 
Very tough. Yeah, you, you look at the odds of the tournament and, and the top eight in terms of odds to finish on the podium. Four of those top eight come from this group. It, it is loaded. There is no break. There is no gimme there in terms of a game that you can kind of take your foot off the gas a little bit. I mean, it's always the case in these tournaments, in these international basketball tournaments, and especially in the Olympics where there's very little room for error. But then especially when your preliminary group is just loaded with skill and talent as this one is, like maybe you can get away with losing one of those first three games because, as you mentioned, the top two go through, but two out of the three third-place teams will go through as wild cards as well. So maybe you get away with one off game early on in the tournament, but even that isn't a guarantee. Uh, all three teams, by the way, are also really different in terms of, like, the, the challenge that they present. I mean, obviously in the game that they're the opponent that they'll see tomorrow with Greece, you've got one of the best players in the tournament. And, and look, I'm not going to call Giannis Dedekumbo the best player in a tournament that also features Nikola Jokic, all of the guys on the U.S., Shea Gilgis Alexander, but he's certainly in the conversation. And if nothing else, I, I would argue that he's the toughest player to guard. Not a ton of depth behind him on the Greek team, but still uh, an elite, elite, elite talent. And then Australia, outside of the U.S. and Canada, has the most NBA players, current NBA players on the team with nine. And Spain is the legacy program. Of course, they've had a ton of success over the years. Not quite what they were, but still a really, really tough team. So, yeah, it's going to be a really tough path to the podium for Canada. They're good enough to do it. But some question marks there. We talked the, the last time that we spoke about the front court being the weakness and the back court being the strength. But since then, some questions have popped up about Jamal Murray. And I, I think that's probably the biggest story going into tomorrow's opener is what can you expect from Murray? OK, so if you're looking at Canada and if you're looking at the teams that are in their group, what's Canada's separator? Like, what are we going to talk about if Canada wins games as the thing that propelled them to those wins? Yeah, it, it's it's got to be the backcourt. It's got to be that star backcourt duo of Shea Gilgis Alexander and Jamal Murray. But now I I think we we've gone from talking about it as a no doubt, a hundred percent strength of this team to I think almost a wild card, or at least in terms of Murray, there's the wild card. He didn't play in the second exhibition game. He played seven minutes in the third exhibition game. All of them coming, by the way, with Shea Gilgis Alexander on the bench, which is interesting. And I'll get to that in a second, but let's focus on Murray for now because with Jamal Murray, the question always is health, given his extensive injury history. And uh, he didn't look very good or very healthy for the Nuggets in the playoffs. Now, in speaking with people with the team, around the team in France, everyone's sort of downplaying this and saying that this is all sort of the plan is to ease him back in after he spent a few days away from the team due to a prearranged personal matter and that they were always going to monitor his usage and his body going into the Olympic tournament. But again, the history. And also, not for nothing, he's in the middle of negotiating an expensive contract extension with the Nuggets, which could be a factor in all of this as well. So, look, he's going to play tomorrow. That's the sense that I get. It's just how much is he going to play and what is he going to look like? And then again, as I mentioned, like you have the question of, are those guys going to be able to build quick chemistry together? Because SGA and Murray have only played one game together, not just during exhibition, but Ever. That was the U.S. game in Vegas, and it didn't look great. So, yeah, I think, like, they, they've got a good shot here, Canada does, at meddling, but I would be very, very surprised if they made it onto the podium unless those two players are great. Not just good, but great. We, we know what to expect from SGA. I'm not sure that we know what to expect from Murray. Well, I remember in 2000 in, in Sydney, it was, of course, Steve Nash who led the way, but that Canadian team did not have nearly the NBA talent that this one does. For sure. And that's why I don't want to undersell that talent by just simplifying it and saying, well, it's going to come down to Murray and SGA. Those are the two most important players on the team. But you're right. Like the depth here is impressive. And like nothing else that we've ever seen this program put together. 
Now, could they have used Andrew Wiggins, especially if Murray is less than 100%? Sure, of course. Could they have used the size of Zach Eady? Of course, as well as a few other guys that you can lift, list off, especially in the front court. Tristan Thompson, Brandon Clark come to mind. But I, I think once we segue away from that star backcourt, by the way, it's more than just Murray and SGA. The guys behind them and Akeel Alexander-Walker and uh, Andrew Nemhard just coming off a, a big extension that he signed with Indiana. Those guys are really good as well. So that's their deepest position in addition to being their best position. Th- they're also really good on the wing, especially defensively, and that's going to come in handy. We talk about the challenge that Giannis presents tomorrow, and, and certainly there aren't a lot of teams in this tournament that can can feel good about their chances going up against the Giannis types, but Canada, I, I think, is one of them just based on the fact that they have an all-NBA defender in Dylan Brooks, as well as Lou Dort, who, who's also really, really good at that position. And as Brooks showed us in that game against France, he defended well above his size, really neutralizing the seven foot four Victor Wembanyama, a guy that he, I mean, he's giving up nearly a foot on Wemby. Where they lack for depth, I I think, is in the front court. But I'll I'll say this. If I I was a bit underwhelmed by the strength that was their backcourt in the exhibition games, I I think the the so-called weakness of the front court didn't look nearly as weak as maybe we expected. Uh, Dwight Powell did a really good job of ma- uh, manning that center position, really getting under Joel Embiid's skin. Not that that's difficult against uh, the U.S. And then uh, being really physical with Gobert against France. I thought Trey Lyles did a nice job in the third exhibition game. Even Kem Birch, who a lot of people have just kind of like ruled out because of his injury history and the fact that that knee injury basically pushed him out of the NBA away from the Raptors a few years ago. He's looked pretty good as an emergency depth big at the end of the bench as well. Kelly Olynyk, we know what he brings in terms of his offense. So yeah, de- depth should definitely be a strength for this team and it might be something that comes in handy, especially going up against some of these really tough teams in their group. If Canada doesn't meddle, Um, Is it seen as a disappointment? Because you take a look at the roster, there's 11 NBA players on this team. You know, you you probably have the second best player in the tournament in in Shea Gilgis Alexander. Um, You know, just those two things alone, you would think, um, should get you on the podium. But would it be a disappointment if they weren't there? I would say, yeah, yes, it would be a disappointment. It wouldn't be a shock just because of the nature of these tournaments and the inexperience of this Canadian team on the world stage. Of course, none of them have played in an Olympic tournament before, and I think that matters, and that's why you go out and you you add a, a Melvin Edgem to the roster, somebody who has a lot of FIBA experience, if for, for nothing else, than his leadership. Those things matter. Chemistry matters, and they're going up against teams that probably have more of that. We've seen the way things can turn out in an Olympic tournament or even at the World Cup where you have an off night and if it comes at the wrong time, like that's it for you. It's interesting the way this works because, yes, the U.S. is the overwhelming favorite in this tournament, but the Americans have never faced as much competition as they will in this Olympic tournament. Obviously, Canada is one of those teams, but... uh, I mean, the the field is stacked here in France. There's probably about six or seven teams at least that you can make a really good case for in terms of meddling, finishing on the podium. But outside of the U.S., I don't think you would say that you are shocked if any of them don't meddle. Like, yeah, France has a good shot. Serbia has a great shot. Australia, we mentioned all the teams in Canada's group. Uh, Germany, I mean, they won the gold at the World Cup last year. There are a lot of really good teams, but the only one I would say that would be truly shocking if they weren't there at the end is the Americans. There, as I said, is very little room for error. So Canada's going to have to be near perfect here. And look, I I mean, what we've seen so far through three games, I think you could take with a grain of salt its exhibition. I, I think there were mixed results. There were obviously those flashes of of optimism and and why you're excited about a team like this is is the defensive potential the star power the depth but I, I think we also saw some of those things that we talked about as being potential concerns and that to me is like if this team runs into 
the Americans somewhere in the knockout stages or even France with their size like that. That could be an issue given the lack of depth in this team's front court. The last time the U.S. didn't win the gold medal in men's basketball was in 2004, upset by Argentina in Athens in the semifinals. The U.S. women have won every gold medal at the Olympic tournament since 1996. Which team, Josh, is less likely to win the gold medal? The men's or the women's American teams? Oh, that's a good question. Um, mo- most of my research leading up to this tournament has been on the men's side. And-, and I know, as I said, how stacked the field is in terms of their level of competition. Um, not as familiar with the women's tournament. Um, so I- I'll just say that it's, it'll probably be more surprising if the men don't win given the I'll level the other of way. NBA I, talent I'd, I'd that's sh- on that team? I'd be shocked if the American women didn't win the gold medal. I, I think yeah. I, I, because they've, they've been so dominant for so long because the American men have had hiccups at times. Now, there was the Redeem team that came back in 2008, and, they, and they, look, they, they've got superstar players, all that, but they've had that before. And, and there are lots of NBA players on other teams. There aren't many WNBA players on other teams, Canada's got a few, but I, I got to think the American women really do dominate this thing. And I, and look, the American, the American men in the, in the warmup have not been exactly world beaters, have they? Yeah. No, I, I was going to say that too, is they've almost looked mortal at, at points here. And again, it's exhibition, so grain of salt. And to be honest with you, I'm not fully buying it. Like they, they, and, and Steve Kerr has made reference to this a few times in training camp, that they're slowly ramping up and slowly ramping up and figuring out what works in terms of lineups and what doesn't. I think at the end of the day, like they have just about everything that they could pull out of that toolbox, whether it's defense, offense, shooting, big men, guards. Uh, They've got a ton of depth. And what I like about what they've done is they're not just, it's not just the 12 best American players in the NBA. I mean, even when Kawhi Leonard had to withdraw, I think a lot of people were expecting the Celtic player to be added would be Jalen Brown instead of, um, instead of White. But they're going for balance and depth and, and a little bit of everything that, that ultimately you need to have a great, well-balanced team Uh, but I agree with you like I I think they've had some close calls here and they're going to face some very tough competition unlike Canada they have a group that's going to be pretty easy I would say to get through so their toughest tests are going to come in those knockout rounds and it could come in the form of Canada for sure Josh, you talked earlier about how, you know, Canada has to defend and they're going to have NBA players that are capable of doing that. Well, you know, front and center is Dylan Brooks. And I'm curious, you know, from your point of view, the difference between Dylan Brooks in NBA rules versus FIBA rules and how maybe that could be a little more of an advantage for him uh, with his physical style of play defending. Yeah, for sure. I I mean, we called... Shea Gilgis Alexander, Jamal Murray, the two most important players on this team. I, I don't think there's any question that the third most important, you might even argue that he's the second most important <laughs> player, maybe even over Murray, is Dylan Brooks, just based on, as I mentioned earlier, the defensive responsibilities that he's going to have in this tournament, starting tomorrow, very likely with Giannis Adetokounmpo. And then you move forward, and, and just about Every team's best player, I would say, you're you're probably going to throw Brooks at, whether he's a perimeter player or a big. And that's the luxury of having a guy like him that's so well-rounded defensively. Obviously, he thrives on that physicality. And that's something that I mentioned earlier, that matchup against Wemby, where he's giving up a ton of size. But one thing that Wemby even after a year of NBA seasoning, isn't really used to seeing is the type of physicality that Brooks brings, and he just loves it. He thrives in that environment. He's going to be booed in France because he's (laughs) booed everywhere he goes, but he embraces the role as the villain. If anything, it kind of fuels him a little bit, And, and to your point, like he's a completely different player in FIBA. I, I think defensively he's able to get away with a few more things just because of the physicality, and that's something that he doesn't have a ton of FIBA experience, but even just playing for Canada a few times, he has a pretty good sense now of how to walk that line and what he can do and what he can't do. But I think the biggest difference that we've seen from him is the offense. In the NBA, he's not really known as an offensive player anymore, which is funny because he, he came out of school into 
to the NBA known as more of an offensive player, but I think he's really embraced his role as a defender and is more of a knockdown shooter, a uh, 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 catch and shoot type of guy with the Rockets and previously with the Grizzlies. But with Canada, he's shown the ability to take threes off the dribble, score off the dribble, put the ball on the floor, get to the rim, does a lot of different things that this team really needs. Again, with the absence of Andrew Wiggins, maybe that's where he would have stepped in and helped a little bit. But now that responsibility falls to guys like Brooks and R.J. Barrett. So, yeah, I I mean, I I think this is an incredibly important player in terms of Canada's chances of meddling. I'm not sure that we would have said that necessarily before the tournament last year, but really just a a breakout performance, a coming out party for Brooks at the World Cup at just the exact moment that he needed it to, right? Like he was just coming off of that ugly breakup with the Grizzlies, they threw him under the bus and kind of used him as a scapegoat, said, we're not re-signing this guy. And I think a lot of people were questioning, okay, well, where is he going to go next? Is he going to get paid? Does anybody even really want him? Is he worth the trouble? And what he's showing now, especially internationally, is that, yeah, well, he does talk a big game and there's sometimes some extracurricular stuff that maybe goes over the top. He can back it up on the floor. And ultimately, as we've seen with agitators in the past, that's ultimately what it comes down to can you back it up on the floor and dylan brooks can well as you see can against greece tomorrow the canadian women take on france uh on uh sunday and the u.s takes on serbia in the men's side on sunday as well josh thanks for talking to us we look forward to following this olympic basketball tournament all right guys looking forward to it talk soon good stuff so uh gonna be interesting i mean you always i mean look the dream team was great i mean these you know the American players, they should walk through this. But there's lots. I mean, I remember watching Ginobili with Argentina in 04. Now, he'd, been, he'd won an NBA championship with San Antonio. He wasn't, a, he wasn't an unknown. But there are lots of good players that can make a difference on other teams. There are, and you have to remember, this is not the NBA. It's not NBA rules. Like right. It's like different this. for guys. You have to create your own space a little bit right. more. You're probably not going to get the calls that you might get on a night-to-night basis in the NBA. So you have to work through uh, a little more traffic uh, than you normally would. And that's different. That's different for these guys. And there's also different, you know, there's no three-in-the-key rule. Like There's no... There's no three-second rule. Like There's a lot of different yeah. rule variations that will trip you up. And, and some of these European teams who have played, you know, the Spanish have played together in these tournaments. They're used and to they the rules. Like they, they play this style. Like They play this style. This is, we're, they're playing international ball, which is very different than NBA ball. It's almost like, you know, if you compare it to hockey, it's when North American teams or, you know, Canada, USA would have to play against the Swedes on Olympic ice when the Swedes have been playing on Olympic ice for their entire seasons, their entire careers. So... It's, uh, yeah, it's different, but listen, Canada's got a very heavy NBA presence and probably the second best player in the tournament. So they should have a very good chance to medal. Uh, some breaking news are Rick Westhead. Never good when Rick Westhead calls you because chances are you've done something wrong. Um, 17, he's reporting 17 players on Canada's men's national soccer team attended a briefing in August of 2021 and watched as head coach John Herdman played a video that showed the Honduran national team's closed practice a day earlier, as sources told TSN. So remember, when Herdman took over the national team, Canada was playing Honduras in CONCACAF qualifying, and the Hondurans stopped their practice because they thought there was a drone flying overhead. Now, earlier today, and we have a clip, I believe, of John Herdman, now the TFC manager, talking about this exact thing. He was asked about whether he ever witnessed this. I've always gone into Olympic Games, World Cups, big events with integrity in mind and the ability to compete at the highest level following the rules and processes. So, you know, from my side, as I say, I'll help Canada soccer where I can um, with that review. But I'm highly confident that in my time as a head coach at an Olympic Games or World Cup, we've never been involved in any of those activities. Okay, so he said at a World Cup of the Olympics... Well, he said big tournament. You could you could parse that any way you want. Yeah. If, if you if you want to split hairs here, he didn't say at no time did we ever do anything like that. He he specifically said at the World Cup and the Olympics. All this information is going to keep coming out now. Well, it's going to because now the dam's breaking. Yes. Now people are talking. So Rick West had reported yesterday, you know, that this was much wi- more widespread 
and long term than had previously been reported. And it seems like every half day we're getting more revelations, right? Like, yeah. Bev Briefman likely did know about what was sure going she on. Knew. She's the leader. This has gone on. She had to know. This has gone on previously. Uh, it may have happened at Copa America. Uh, Jesse Marsh, the Canadian head coach, men's head coach, apparently was offered, you know, to have drones spying and, and so we don't do that. But now Herdman's in a tough spot. I know he's on he's on the record as saying he basically, you know, we have integrity, which which I, I don't know if he in, in a way he directly denies um any wrongdoing here. He basically just said, you know, we operate with integrity, but clearly if you have a drone flying over the other team's closed practice and you're showing it to your players, you're not operating with integrity for the game. What I wonder is how much this might affect what FIFA does. If FIFA is going to start looking at this and saying, you know, Canada's been doing this for a long time. This isn't a one. We're not isolating this to the Olympics. And and apparently Canada twice had drone, at least twice had drones in the air watching other teams, watching the New Zealand practices. If FIFA is going to look at this and say, Canada's been doing this for years on the men's and women's side, we got to whack Canada. Well, a hundred percent. That was always like, that was always my stance on this is that FIFA is going to set an example with Canada because Canada is not one of the big players on the international stage, so right. they can. Um, and I don't know, like we, we talked about maybe deducting the points from the New Zealand game. It feels like it's going to have to be bigger than that because this is going to be, it's going to go back so far and it's going to be so widespread within the organization that it's probably not just at the, you know, men's and women's level. It's going to be at the under 18, under 16. Like it's really going to go deep into the, the organization of, of Soccer Canada. This is going to be an ongoing story, and uh, we're expecting to hear from FIFA sometime in the next 24 hours. Uh, so this is the report from Rick Westhead. Uh, 17 Canadian men's team players shown a video of a Honduran team's closed practice two days before the country's played in a World Cup qualifying game. Staff members of Canada's National Women's U16 team were allegedly engaged in spying as early as 2016. Two former Canada soccer contractors tell TSN they were pressured to film the closed practices of opposing teams. One contractor said they filmed two U.S. women's national team practices before a game in 2017 and details the instructions they were giving. given. That's seven years ago. That's seven years ago. Yeah. So this is, this is a breaking story, and it's not breaking in a good way for Canada soccer at no. all. No, it's not. So and It's going to continue. All right, so uh, there's still more to come on that. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk to our pal... Uh, Lawrence Applebaum, the CEO of Golf Canada, the uh, CPKC Women's Open, the 50th annual itineration of the Canadian Women's Open is on, underway in Calgary. There's some smoke in the air there. We'll talk about that. And Brooke Henderson's on fire as well. We shouldn't, shouldn't say it like that, but Brooke Henderson is playing well. Uh, three under through nine holes. So that's coming up on Overdrive on TSN2, on TSN 1050, and on your home speakers. A little hip to get you ready for the weekend. Gord Miller, Frankie Corrado here on Overdrive on TSN 1050 on this Mail It In Friday, brought to you by Boston Pizza, Canada's favorite sports bar. BP is serving fish bowls and cold pints on the patio all summer long, so grab your sunscreen. Let's have ourselves a weekend. The Boston Pizza patio is calling. Did you go see the hip during their last tour? I did not see them on their last tour, but I'd seen them before. Yeah. I was out of the country when they were through southern Ontario, but uh, yeah. Unbelievable concert. One of the best. Where did you see him, Toronto? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. just saw them in Toronto. Yeah, uh, I mean, they were terrific, and he was obviously what a showman. Yeah, and what a and what a hockey fan. Yes, what a hockey fan. A huge, a great friend of Joe Thornton's, a huge Bruins fan, just a and a wonderful guy who's missed an icon who's missed. Um, so going on in sports, a lot going on obviously this weekend uh, with the Olympics starting and everything else happening, but the C CPKC. Women's Open is ongoing in Calgary. Round two today, and Brooke Henderson is on a bit of a roll. She's 300 through nine on the day, so 300 for the tournament. And she is now, overall, three shots off the lead, tied for fourth. Uh, our pal Lawrence Applebaum is the CEO of Golf Canada. He is uh, on site in Calgary. Uh, Lawrence, how excited are you about Brooke's day so far? Oh, it's good, Gord. It's like rolling back the years when you used to cover golf. <laughs> so good to hear you talking about scores again. I know it's been a while for me, um, but it's great. I, I got to ask you, though, um, the conditions there. We know there's a lot of wildfires in the area. There's been some alerts in terms of air quality. How have you managed that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you right right off the hop. It's um, 
it's been a big change on site here. So in Calgary at the Earl Grey Golf Club, you probably wouldn't know some of the devastation that's been going on in, in, in around the area. So first off, uh, we have a lot of friends and uh, friends not only in golf, but overall the Jasper community. And so our, our, we're thinking about those folks and, and getting them the help and supporting them as, as best we can. In Calgary, because um, we're right sort of in the city at Earl Grey, it's been night and day. You know, yesterday we were dealing with uh, what looked like a little bit of almost, you know, fog. We we had very high, very high temperatures uh, during the practice rounds, and then all of a sudden, uh, some of the, uh, the 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 smoke came through. But the temperatures dropped. Um, we had a bit of a wind, and so it it literally on site feels like a beautiful midsummer day with a bit of wind. So it's kind of a, an interesting juxtaposition of what we've had the last uh, 24 hours. What's Brooks' confidence level right right now? Oh, it's, it's, um, so I, I was able to, to follow her on the front nine and, um, she could have easily been, she's four, you know, three under, as you said, Gord, um, she could have been five under after the first seven holes. I mean, everything was dialed in, uh, birdie putts, six to 10 foot birdie putts. And she looks amazing. And it is so nice to see Brooke uh, Henderson playing on home soil. She's so sort of in the mode. She's it's Canada Day. Our Friday event is always a uh, Canada Day red and white. So she's she's decked out in the Olympic colors and playing amazing golf. And so I think as she makes the turn here, she's sort of tied for fourth right now. And I think uh, the back nine a little harder, but um, great showing by her and a few of the Canadians that are in good shape for the weekend. How nice is it to have her kind of in contention on the weekend, L.A., and, and what does that do for the galleries that are following her at a tournament like this? Uh, you're bang on, Frankie. You know, it's it's um, this tournament is, is really uh, been on such a trajectory, and we have Brooke Henderson uh, to thank for that. You know, she's 13-time winner on the LPGA Tour. Um, there's a handful of athletes in our sport that uh, bring crowds. You know, a, a few of them on the on the on the guy side, like like Rory, like Tiger did, and and a few others. But um, Brooke live, there's probably there's probably fifteen to seventeen thousand people on site today, and I bet you ten thousand of them are following Brooke right now. And so a lot of the LPGA tour, they, they come out here and, um, the golf course is in really it, Earl Grey is probably not on some people's radar, especially from outside the province of Alberta, but it's a gem of a golf course, beautiful showing really go- gorgeous sort of right on the reservoir of, uh, of the city of Calgary. And so Brooke doing so well, it, it bodes well. Uh, we're not, you know, we're, we're coming on golf channel just now and then, uh, we'll be on, on TSN all weekend. So we're really looking forward to the weekend ahead. And Lawrence, Brooke is playing in the Olympics, which I find interesting because the other Olympic players are already in Paris. So she start, women's golf starts, what, on the 7th, I think? Yeah, no, a, a little bit earlier. So it, it is interesting. The, um, the fellas are already in, and uh, I, I caught a couple pictures of great shots of Corey Connors yeah. and Nick Taylor um, with the Olympic delegation. So uh, they, that was a big thing, uh, you know, really life uh, bucket list item for, for both of them to be at the opening ceremonies. And the men's competition uh, starts on um, earlier. It'll go four days, a couple days off, and then the women's competition. So both Brooke Henderson and Elena Sharp from Hamilton uh, are Olympians uh, for, the, for the 2024 version. And it's a, a, an awesome golf course, uh, Le National, right in Paris. <laughs> and um, and a an really interesting field. I mean, it's the best in the world, but there's 60 player fields. So a field that is really gettable, a field that, uh, you know, I think we have really solid medal contention on both the men's and women's side. And to see Brooke playing well in form, um, I mean, she's 26 years old and this will be her third Olympics. So pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing result for her. L.A., you talked about Earl Grey, and, you know, I think there's such a source of pride here with us Canadian golfers when it comes to all eyes being on our national opens, the men's and women's. And I know when the men's side comes around, we want our courses to hold up. We don't want to see a minus 22, minus 24 score win in Canada. Um, You know, how does Earl Grey hold up? And do you, you know, make a point of making it somewhat difficult or more difficult for the players in the field? 
Yeah, so when 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 we go west um, uh, from sort of the Toronto area and, and we get a chance to play golf, we we might think of some of the courses like a, a Shaughnessy that we've played at before, or, or um, some of the, the courses out near Whistler or, or or Banff. And in Calgary, this this Earl Grey is a gem of a golf course. They've got amazing golf course here in gen- general, but. When the LPGA Tour comes to town, when the PGA Tour comes to town, sort of the whole community bonds together. And so the superintendent they have here has brought in sort of all the big guns from all the courses around. Um, they've been on some water restrictions uh, for some right. of, uh, for a lot of the summer. Luckily, they, they pull from the reservoir here, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's, it's non-drinkable water, obviously, so they can, they can use that water very, very liberally. The, you would put feet on, you know, feet on the ground here. It comes, it's, it's going to look lush. It, it, it is lush, but it looks green as can be on TV. It's a golf course that holds up. Um, the Henderson family was sort of, you know, uh, Brooks Caddy's her sister, Brittany, and she paced it off at one point. She's like, this, these two holes have 17 yard pinch points, you know, hitting onto a fairway that is 17 yards wide. So she's got either got to uh, hit it deeper and longer, which Brooke is probably one of the longer hitters actually on tour, or some of the players sometimes lay back a little bit, but it's a great test. Um, it's definitely one that people should put on their, on their, on their sort of uh, Alberta or West Western bucket list because it holds up um, lots of good birdies, lots of good scoring, but it's probably more the wind is kind of the protection of the course right now because these winds that have helped us get through this sort of tough weather are also protecting uh, some of the scoring right now. And, and to Frankie's point, you don't want it to be 20 under, but, you know, I, I was around covering major championship golf, you know, in the in the Tiger era when, you know, the USGA, you know, wrecked Shinnecock Hills, you know, wrecked a lot of courses, just made them almost unplayable and and really took the roars out of the game. Like, how do you balance that? Like, you want fans to, to see great shots and, and, and make birdies sometimes without it turning into the Disney classic where 30 under wins it. Yeah, it, it's a real balance in golf. We love we, we love seeing birdies. We love seeing it. I mean, hearing the roars from across this property, and you know, you know it's when you know Brooke had a, a three hole three hole birdie stretch. You know, boom, boom, boom. That's you know that they call it. The, you know, it's, that's the turkey right there. It's three birdies, and uh, the roars that are going up. So we want to see scoring. Everyone wants to see it, but I guess what there still is that that holdover of I I don't want to see these massive numbers. I want to see a test. I want to see them play, and as you said, Gord. You know, back when they played in Shinnecock and, and, you know, they had some burnout and some runoffs and it was too hard almost. Um, it was too hard. We, they, they wrecked we, it. They were, and, and we can, you know, we feel their pain, you know, uh, as people who sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, you know, I know you're, you're, you're flirting, Frankie, with the, you know, in the 70s all the time, but it's like we want to see <laughs> uh, people enjoy their golf. and. Right. And so out here, it's a nice balance. Uh, the LPGA Tour has done a great job finding the balance between a tough test and a fair test. Uh, greens are rolling amazing, but it is so incredible to see the fans come out to watch Brooke, the fans coming out to watch our Canadians, and very nicely, we've got about about you know, six to eight Canadians who are going to make the cut for the weekend, which is super exciting for, for Golf Canada and our high-performance program. Well, Lawrence, thanks for talking to us. Uh, enjoy your time in Calgary this weekend. Uh, that's my part of the world. I, I'm from Alberta, so, uh, you know, if you get a chance, uh, the chop house in Calgary is pretty good. <laughs> Just saying. One other thing, well, L.A., make, make sure when, when these caddies are doing their, you know, walkthroughs of the course, no drones. Like, walk it on foot. Even, Let's not rely on drones. Listen, we've got a very, very disciplined group of caddies out here. <laughs> yes, I'm sure They're not do. even using range finders. <laughs> you know, there's not even range finders. But I, I, I'll tell you, it's, we, are, we are keeping our eyes on the golf course. We are, we are front foot, and we are going to have an incredible weekend for the Canadians. Good stuff, Lawrence. Thanks for talking to us. Okay, guys, have a great weekend. Thanks to all. Thanks. There's Lawrence Applebaum, the CEO of Golf Canada. I don't know. Just a little drone humor. Is it too soon? You're, you're droning on. Ah. You're droning on. So, but there's lots of breaking news on that. So, uh, yeah, so uh, that's great. Uh, great to see for Brooke Henderson because you, you kind of had an up and down year. But to be on a roll in Canada and going into the Olympics. Yes, exactly. And you know what just drives people to that tournament? It's going to drive people in Calgary to go there, yeah. get involved, be sure. a part of the gallery, and it's going to drive eyeballs on TSN all weekend. She's three There's off. a promo. She's, there you go. She's three off the lead, having played 10 holes in the second round. That's all coming up this weekend 
on TSN. Still to come, best bets from FanDuel coming up on Overdrive on TSN 2, TSN 50, TSN 1050 rather, and your home speakers. There you go. Oh, Jimmy. Nice. Um, all right. Today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble a same-game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. So now it's on me to make the FanDuel best bet of the day. So the Blue Jays take it on Texas tonight. The Jays are coming off a 13-0 home loss yesterday to Tampa. They are now taking on a Texas team that has won five in a row, the defending World Series champions. Who's the favorite tonight? You think it would be Texas. It's Toronto. Really? On the money line... The Jays are minus 122. Now, we always assume that everyone knows what you're talking about with this. So some people don't. So the money line means that at minus 122 to win $100, you have to bet 122. Doogie, can you confirm that? <laughs> I can confirm that. Yes. Thanks, so, so with Texas, they're plus 104. So you bet 100, you win 104. There we go. I'm taking Texas. I would take Texas too. Yeah. Kikuchi's pitching for Toronto tonight. I'm going to take the under. And so total two plus two fifty nine. So you bet a hundred, you win two fifty nine. So I, I think we assume that everyone knows all these gambling terms. Yeah. Not everyone does. No, that's fair. The other thing, like the Jimmy Garcia trade happens today, and that might be a little bit of a shot or a little bit of a message through the room that, like, listen, it's happening now. Yeah. And now it, it almost it almost becomes tougher for guys. I think to regardless of how professional you are and locked in you are as an athlete, like it, it does start to creep in a little bit that things are going to go the opposite way here. Not the opposite way, but like things are going to start coming apart. Well, with the Chris team. Bassett comments after the game last night, you know, no one's got clean hands here. You just get the sense, and Steve Phillips talked about it in the second hour about how, you know, there, there can become a mindset. Look, Jimmy Garcia went to the ballpark today. He was packed. Yes. Like he was, he left, he was packed. He said it was the easiest thing ever. He knew he was getting traded and he was packed and he's gone. Kikuchi's pitching for the last time for now. As a Blue Jay, who knows he comes back in the offseason as a free agent. But there, there has to be, I mean, you've played on teams like this when you know what's coming. Like, you, you know you're looking at guys that aren't going to be here next week. You know who really would thrive? The guys who get the chance. The guy who didn't have right. an opportunity all season long, and now he's getting that chance. Those guys are really focused, really dialed in. But the thing is, those guys haven't been getting the opportunity probably because they're not as good. You know what I mean? So the guys right. that are the more prominent players... Maybe you've been around a little bit. It's like the competitive juices are starting to get you know squeezed out of this group as these trades uh, start to happen. And it, and you know what's going to be grim down the stretch if Kikuchi's gone, you know Garcia's gone. There's more. There's more players going. It's it's not going to be more enjoyable here. It's not. No. It's going to be a, for a team that was expected to contend. It's going to be a miserable death march through August and September. And we knew this was happening, right? Like that's a player on an expiring contract. Like this was just a formality. Kikuchi, that's a formality. If you can find a home for Kiermaier and Turner, like those are formalities. It's now, you know, going to be intriguing as to what the Blue Jays do with the players that still have team control and are still under contract with the Jays. Well, it, it sounds like they're not going to do much with that. It doesn't sound like, th this sounds like the Jays are going to make, you know, nibbles. They're going to nibble at it. They're going to guys that they don't have control over next year. They're going to go, but everyone else are going to bring back and they're going to hope to contend in 2025. And the hardest thing to do in sports in management is decide, are we a good team that had a bad year or are we a bad team? Uh, it's and not just one bad year though. That's, it's, that's the thing. It's a bad year with multiple bad right. instances over the last couple years. Right? So right. you, you kind of, you kind of know what you are, but you're going to make these trades the guys on the expiring contracts. And if you're not going to make the baseball trade, quote unquote, then you have to have a very busy off season. The, the term internal improvement cannot be said again this off season. No, it cannot. Cause that will not sell. All right, uh, Frankie, great to see you, buddy. Hope you, you have too. a great weekend. There's going to be lots to watch in sports this weekend. Lots going on. Hope you enjoy some time outside as well. Uh, Brian Hayes is back on Monday. I believe Doogie, is he back on Monday? No, he's not back on Monday. The Tat Jimmy, Man. It's, it's mailing Monday. Jimmy Taddy's here on Monday. Yeah, it's Great. the Tat Man. All right, that'll be on over. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes. Thanks to you for listening and watching. Frankie, thank you for, you for being here. Thank you, Gord. Overdrive is back on Monday at 4 o'clock. We'll chat then. Yes, we will.